Happy Resurrection Day. Happy Resurrection Day. Let me try that one more time. Happy Resurrection Day. Happy Resurrection Day. He is risen indeed. Amen. Uh, it is Annie Armstrong uh, offering time of the year. And uh, every week during the month of April, uh, we like to be reminded uh, of what uh, what we participate in. Whenever we uh, give to the Annie, offer, Annie Armstrong offering, uh, we are helping to spread the gospel. We're helping to help others to, to hear about this resurrected Jesus that we're gathering to worship today. And so, as we give, uh, this is those works as we saw this morning are things that we're helping uh, to promote. Right? If we if we can't go or we're not called to go in that sense, uh, we can uh, finance those who are uh, called to go and do those types of works, church plans and whatnot. And so, anyway, if you haven't given already. Uh, prayerfully consider how God would have you to give uh, this year's. Uh, that being said, let's get to our, our text this morning. I want us to look in Romans chapter 6 this morning as we are reminded of why the resurrection of Jesus matters so much on the, this Resurrection Sunday. We'll just be looking at a few verses, verses 5 through 11. Uh, and we think about this day and what it represents. Not only is the cross empty, but the tomb is empty too. That's right. right. That that uh, that we're intentional as, as Baptists. We uh, the way we adorn our, our our facilities and our sanctuaries. As you look at our crosses, they don't have Jesus. There is no Jesus on the cross because he's not there anymore. He's not in the tomb, any, in the tomb anymore either. And so today we're remembering not only the death of Jesus as the atonement for our sins. We are also celebrating the resurrection of Jesus that give, gave the evidence that. Uh, that God, in fact, did accept His offering uh, for our sins. It, it gives tangible proof of that the payment of sin has been received. And because Jesus died on the cross, that God accepted His death as the payment for our sins, we now have the blessed assurance that our sins are forgiven and that we have, in fact, been reconciled back to God if we believe in Him. And so when we think about this question today, is the resurrection of Jesus more important than the crucifixion of Jesus, right? Because some would pit one against the other, right? Well, we is it, is, it, is it more important that Jesus was crucified, or is it more important that he was resurrected? The answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's yes. It's not that one is more important than the other because they're both important. They're, they're both critical. They're both necessary to redeem us and reconcile us back to God. Without the crucifixion of Jesus, there would be no resurrection of Jesus. Right. And without the, res without the resurrection of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus serves absolutely no purpose whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Right? Both were needed. Both were necessary. The crucifixion of Jesus matters, and so does the resurrection of Jesus. You see, as the people of God, we do not love, we do not worship, we do not serve a dead Savior. We love, worship, and serve a resurrected and living Savior. Amen? Amen? That's who we gather to worship this morning. Last Sunday, we were reminded of why the crucifixion of Jesus matters. And the Apostle Paul told us about this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. We were reminded that Jesus was sent to the cross to rescue us from sin's grip and to ransom us from sin's price and to reconcile us back to God. But you see, none of those things would have happened if the resurrection didn't happen. That's right. Right? That, that's the connection between the crucifixion and the resurrection. None of those things would have happened if the women had arrived to the tomb and the stone would have not been rolled away. None of those things would have happened if Jesus' dead and decomposing body was still in the same place that Joseph and Nicodemus had left it three days earlier. But praise God, the resurrection did happen. Praise God the resurrection did happen. Praise God that the stone was rolled away and that the tomb was empty. Praise God that there wasn't a dead and decaying body that needed to be anointed properly for burial. Instead, there was an angel that told them what had happened. A messenger from God. Matthew 28, 5-7 says this, But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for He is risen, as He said. Come, see the place where they, the, the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell His disciples that He is risen from the dead, 
And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. But not only that, there's more. Verse 9 tells us that Jesus met them on their way and told them to rejoice. And they held him by the feet and worshipped him. And now here we are, 2,000 plus years later, and we are still rejoicing and we are still worshiping the same resurrected Jesus. Amen. amen, amen, and amen. So why does the resurrection of Jesus matter? Well, let a man who had his own personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus tell us. Well, let the Apostle Paul tell us why the resurrection of Jesus matters to us, or at least why it should matter to us who have believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior. But it should also matter to those who haven't believed in the Lord Jesus yet. And I emphasize the word yet, right? Because every week that we gather, as the word goes forth in the Sunday school hour, in the preaching hour, as we sing the word of God, and as we uh, praise Him with, this, with music, uh, my hope and my prayer, as well as your hope and your prayer, is that someone would be saved today. That, that someone would experience that resurrection life that, that Jesus makes possible today. That's my hope and that's my prayer. And so let's uh, grab our Bibles now if you're able and let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. The Apostle Paul writes, For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's Word. Father, we are so, so grateful for this day and what it represents. We thank you for giving us your Son, Jesus, who died on the cross, who was buried in the tomb, but rose to the dead three days later, just like he said he would defeating sin, death, and hell once and for all, for all who would believe in Him. And so God, I thank You for the cross and thank You for the empty tomb. And Father, I pray that You would remind us today uh, why the resurrection of Jesus matters so much to us as Your people. And Father, as Your Word goes forth, I pray that there be any here with us today that have not yet believed in Jesus, have not believed in this resurrected Jesus, that today would be that day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Missed you last week, Lonnie. It was quiet, quiet in here. So you uh -oh. have to make up for last week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could have pulled a, a half dozen or more reasons uh, for why the resurrection of Jesus matters from this uh, passage. Uh, but I whittled it down to four for, for time's sake. So we want to have lunch after the service and not supper, right? <laughs> and so I, 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 I limit it to four. Uh, but if you're a Christian, nothing that you hear today uh, will be new to you or it should be new to you. Um, uh, this should just be a, a, a kind of a refreshing of your memory, almost as the Sunday school hour was, right? We're just being reminded of what God's Word tells us. Now, if you're not a Christian yet, it's, it's likely that everything that you hear today may very well be new to you. But then again, I believe that's probably why you're here. That's why you are you came to church on this resurrection day, to, to hear what all the fuss is about, to hear what Easter is all about, to hear what the resurrection of Jesus is all about. And so I hope that, that that's what you'll find today. The, reason, the first reason that we, uh, the resurrection of Jesus matters is because we have the assurance of our res resurrection from the dead, right? right? Our own resurrection from the dead. Verse 5 says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we, will also, we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. 
I love this statement by Pastor Tim Keller. Some of you are familiar with, with who he is, a, a great man of God. He says this, he says, One fruit of, of union with Christ is certainty. Since all that is true of Jesus is true of us, and since he rose to new life, so we know that we are living that new life. And that new life points forward to the future state of perfect glory we shall enter with him. We will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. Have you ever thought about that? Everything that's true of Jesus is true of us, those who have placed our faith in him. We, we share in his glory. We share in, in, in his victory over sin, death, and hell. The, the, the key word in this verse is certainly. Right? Certainly. Any Anytime the Word of God tells us that something is certain, it's definitely going to happen or, or it already has. We don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder uh, if it will take, take place or not, uh, or not. It's the certainty of God's Word that gives us the blessed assurance that we need to, to, to be and to do all that God's Word calls us to be and to do. Right? We have this assurance from God's Word. Uh, if or since we repented of our sins and believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have been united together with Him in the likeness of His death. And likewise, if we have been united together with Him in the likeness of His resurrection. See, Jesus' death was our death. right? He, he took our place. His death was our death and His resurrection was our resurrection. It was on the cross that Jesus took our place and died the death that we deserved. He became sin for us and took God's full wrath in our place for our sins. Not for His sins. He had no sins. Right. It was for our sins. And so the question you might be asking is, how are we united together in the likeness of Jesus' death? His death and resurrection, uh, the, the, the death that He died was the death that we deserved. Right? He was our substitute, our sinless substitute. He is the Lamb of God. Jesus died for our sins, and because He died for our sins, by grace and through faith, we are now dead to sin. Sin no longer has dominion over us. Right? That's what the Bible says. We, we, we may not always live that way, or we may not always apply that truth to our life, but it's true nonetheless. That's what God's Word says. Sin no longer has dominion over us. We'll unpack that more fully in reason number two. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, our sins were nailed to the cross with Him. Amen? That's right. Our sins were nailed to the cross with Him. And so, if we're, if we're united together in the likeness of His death, how are we united together in the likeness of His resurrection? And again, I would just refer to Pastor Tim Keller and what he just said. All that is true of Jesus is also true of us. To be clear, that's only true for those who have repented of their sins and believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior. So I want to be clear on that. It's not just a universal truth. It's not just for everyone. It's for everyone that has believed in Jesus. Right. It's for saved people. Then and only then is all that is true of Jesus true of you. Because Jesus was resurrected from the dead on the third day, like He said He would, like He said He would, uh, we can be certain that we will also be resurrected from the dead too. And you may be thinking to yourself, that's great, Brother Mike. That's so encouraging. I'm so excited about that. But, but what happens to a believer when he or she dies? And that's a, that's a good question, right? When we think about that, we're talking about resurrection. Uh, the Bible makes it clear their bodies go into the ground until Christ comes back to judge the world and make all things new, right? That's why we have homegoing services. That's why we have a cemetery. That's why we, all that takes place. But the good news is this, that their body goes into the ground, but their soul goes immediately into the presence of God. That their, their, their soul immediately goes to heaven to be with the Lord. That's why Paul wrote what he did in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8, as a source of encouragement. He says this, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in, if in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven, if indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. 
So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen. So this is what God's Word tells us. As Christians, we can be confident and well pleased to know that when we close our eyes in death, the next time we open our eyes, we'll be present with the Lord. Amen. Right? That's a great source of comfort for us when we lose yeah. loved ones. Right? Loved ones, when they pass, when they go home, we say they're going home. And we rejoice in this. We can be confident and well pleased to know this of those who have gone on before us. Likewise, we can also be confident and well pleased to know that one day we will be re reunited with our resurrected bodies, which will be perfect in every way. We'll receive glorified bodies. All the aches and the pains and the troubles that we deal with right now, all those things will be gone. They'll take all those things away. No, no more back pains, no more problems with our hearts and, and memory and, and, and all the things that we all struggle with now will all be gone. You say, well, how is, that, how is that possible? That sounds almost too good to be true. Because all that is true of Jesus is also true of us who have believed in Jesus. Because all that is true of Jesus is true for us who have believed in Jesus. Because all who have believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior have certainly been united together with Him in the likeness of His resurrection. Because Jesus is alive and He will live forevermore, those who believe in Him will also be raised from the dead and live forevermore. Right? That's the promise that we have of everlasting life. Right? We have this promise. The resurrection of Jesus matters because it gives us the assurance of our resurrection. Jesus' resurrection guaranteed our resurrection. Amen? Amen? It's a guarantee. It will come to pass. The second reason that the resurrection of Jesus matters is because we have the assurance of our release from the bondage of sin. Verses 6 and 7. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. You see, we're not, you know, we're not experts on crucifixion. We don't know uh, as much about the cross as the people in ancient times. The Romans understood, and uh, the Jewish people that lived in about and during that time period, they understood as well that the cross wasn't used to to wound people. Uh, the 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 cross was meant to execute people. It was a, it was an instrument of death. Once you were affixed to a cross, you didn't come down till you were dead. Right? They, 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 they didn't uh, you know, leave them up there a little bit and take them down and, and, and patch them back up and send them on their way. It was meant to execute people. And crucifixion was a horrible way to die. And it was reserved for the vilest of criminals. To the Jews, to be crucified was evidence that someone was cursed by God. Right? Anyone that hangs on a tree is cursed by God. And that's how they would, would view this, especially with Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, the curse of our sin was placed on Him. Jesus' death on the cross paid the penalty for our sins, but it also released us from the power of sin so that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And that's what doesn't make any sense for us whenever some of us find ourselves bound up in sin, that we're living as if we are slaves of sin, as if we have never been released from the, 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 the power of sin over our life. Now, do we struggle with sin? Absolutely, we, we do. But none of us should be in bondage to sin if we've been set free, That's right? right? But, but from what Christ has done for us. As a Christian, when Jesus died on the cross, the old you died with Him. The old you died with Him. The old you was in bondage to sin, completely controlled by your sinful nature. Before you heard the Gospel and repented of your sins and believed in Jesus, you were a slave of sin. Sin was your master. Right. right? Was. Notice I use past tense. Was your master. As a Christian, your life can be described in two parts. The old you and the new you. The you before you got saved and the, and the you now. The one after you got saved. The old you is the you before you were crucified with Christ. The new you is the you after the old you was crucified with Christ. The old you was in bondage to sin. 
the new you has been freed from sin's power. And again, to be clear, we don't become incapable of sinning after we get saved. I've heard some people say things like that. Right? That I, I, don't, I don't sin anymore. I said, well, that must be nice. Give me some of that. How'd that happen? Right? But, but we're, it's not that we're incapable of sinning after we get saved, but we should have a strong desire not to sin. We should have a strong desire to be holy in all of our contact, uh, conduct, uh, a strong desire to live righteously, to be holy, for He who called us is holy. Right? Warren Wiersbe describes the, the new desire for holiness that we should have in Christ this way. In Jesus Christ we have died to sin so that we no longer want to continue in sin. He says, but we are not dead to sin, we are also alive in Christ. We have been raised from the dead and now walk in the power of His resurrection. We walk in newness of life because we share His life. What a great, great statement. The crucifixion of Jesus set us free from the power of sin and the resurrection of Jesus has given us the power to resist the temptation of sin. We can resist sin. Did you know that? We, we, we can... We can push back against temptation. We can, we can say no to sin. We don't have to sin. We're not slaves to sin. You're, you're not forced to sin. We used to have that old nature that made us slaves to sin, but now we have a new nature, a righteous nature. And so now sin is a choice. Before it wasn't a choice, but now it is. We have the power to resist the temptation of sin. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. As Christians, not only have we been crucified with Christ, Christ now lives in and through us by His Spirit. Not only have we been crucified with Christ, Christ now lives in and through us by His Spirit. If you're like me, you hate it when you give in to the temptation of sin, don't you? I hope you do. Right? Whenever we give in and I find myself failing all the time. And so what that means for me is that, that all throughout the day when I find myself stumbling in sin, giving in to sin, I, I feel rotten most of the day. Right? Because I hate it. I, I find myself being like the Apostle Paul in, in Romans 7, the next chapter. I find myself uh, not doing the things I ought to do and practicing the things I shouldn't do. The right. things that I hate. See, that's good. We should hate sin. That's right. We should hate sin around us. We should hate sin in our own lives. So the question is, when will we, when will we, we truly be free? When will we no longer be tempted by sin? That's the question to be asking. And unfortunately, I don't have a, a satisfying answer for you. Because the Word of God tells us that won't happen until the last trumpet sounds. <laughs> when our corrupted bodies will be made incorruptible in the twinkling of an eye. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 54. He says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall, be, we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet." For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this, incorrupt, this corruptible must be put on incorruption and this mortal must put on in, immortality so that when this incorruptible has put on incorruption and this mort, mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory. You see, church, the resurrection of Jesus matters because it gives us the assurance of our release from the bondage of sin. If the Son of Man makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. That's Jesus. Jesus said that. Yes. The third reason that the resurrection of Jesus matters is because we have the assurance of our residency with Christ. Verses 8 and 9. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over Him. If death no longer has dominion over Christ, death no longer has dominion over those of us 
who have believed in Christ. Because Jesus was raised from the dead and dies no more, those of us who have believed in Him also have been raised from the dead and we will die no more. One day. That's right. <laughs> One day. Oh, glorious day. Death in the grave wasn't Jesus' home and it isn't a Christian's home either because we shall live with Him. We shall live with Him. One of the most comforting passages in the Bible for Christians is John 14, 1-3. I share it every time I'm asked to, to, to do a, a funeral or a homegoing service. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's amazing, isn't it? The reason that Christians look forward to our eternal home, our heavenly home, is because we will be with Jesus for all of eternity. Yes, we look forward to reuniting with past loved ones and those who have gone on before us and children and, 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 and husbands and wives and fathers and mothers and all those who have gone on before. But most of all, we're excited about being with Jesus for all eternity. That Jesus has a place prepared for us in heaven so that where He is, there we may be also. Amen. If you have died with Christ, then you shall also live with Him. As believers, our eternal residency will be with Christ in heaven. So we look forward to being with Christ in heaven, but what about now? You see, all these have future implications, but they also have present implications as well. Every follower of Christ is filled with the Spirit of Christ. He has taken up residency within us, and He now abides with us. You see, before Jesus was arrested and crucified, He told them that, that, uh, about the, that He would come to them. In John 14, again, verses 15 and 18, He says, If you love Me, keep My commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Amen. Also after the resurrection and before Jesus ascended back into heaven, He promised the disciples that He would be with them always, even to the end of the age. So how do we know that Jesus was raised from the dead? Because the Spirit of the resurrected Christ not only dwells with us, He dwells within us. That's right. Not only dwells with us, He dwells within us. Not only that, the Spirit of the resurrected Christ will abide with us, not just temporarily, but forever. Right. Forever. The resurrection of Jesus matters because it gives us the assurance of our residency with Christ both now and throughout all of eternity. And fourth, fourthly and finally, the fourth reason that the resurrection of Jesus matters is because we have the assurance of our relationship with God in Christ. Verses 10 and 11. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, it's only by grace and through faith in Christ that everything that is true about Christ is also true about those who have believed in Christ. It was while Jesus was in the midst of bearing our sins on the cross that He was forsaken by His Father. Remember what He said? My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? And some of you may be asking, what, what does that mean? It means that Jesus experienced the, the separation and the broken relationship that our sin created between us and God. Remember, He took our place. That's right. He experienced the separation. He experienced the broken relationship that, that, that we deserved. And once Jesus was done atoning for the sins of the world, He cried out, It is finished. It is finished. And so again, what does that mean when, when He said that? It means that the work of the atoning for the sins of the world was finished. There was nothing more to be done. There was nothing else to be done. Nothing else could be done. 
The price had been paid and there was no longer a reason for separation or a broken relationship with God for those who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And three days later, he came, he came out of that grave. He raised the dead and the life that he lives, he lives to God. That's right. The life that he lives, he lives to God. Why? Because his relationship with his Father was restored. It was restored perfectly. Likewise, because Jesus rose from the dead, our relationship with God is restored too. That's the point. Right? That's the whole point. That's the whole point of the death of Jesus. That's the whole point of the resurrection of Jesus. So that we can be restored to God. That we can be reconciled with God. That separation that our sin created has been done away with. Removed. That's the point. We're to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I really appreciate this quote by Robert Mounts regarding this verse. He said this, The cross was sin's final move. The resurrection was God's checkmate. The game is over. Sin is forever in defeat. Christ the victor died to sin once for all and lives now in unbroken fellowship with God. Amen. I mean, have you ever really stopped and considered the implications of what life would be like if Jesus had not been raised from the dead? I mean, think about it. It's, it's terrifying. It should be terrifying. It means that if Jesus wouldn't have raised from the dead, if the women showed up and the, the, the stone was still there, and they had to get somebody to roll it away, and they go inside, and there is Jesus' body. Still broken, still bloody, decaying, right? Death is taken over. We'd all be lost and without hope. That's what it would mean, right? We'd all be condemned in our sins. That we would live our entire lives in bondage to sin only to die condemned in our sins. What a terrible existence. What a terrible existence. If Jesus would not have risen from the dead and came out of the tomb on the third day like He promised He would, we would not be able to rise from the dead and come out of our tombs either. But He did and so will we according to the Scriptures. That's right. But he did, and so will we, according to the Scriptures. Another encouraging passage from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18. So again, the Apostle Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we have believed that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we, we thus shall always, shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Why are these words of comfort to God's people? Because God's people have the assurance of their relationship with God and it has been restored because of their faith in Jesus Christ. That's why. That's right. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, every believer will also be raised from the dead. Because Jesus was restored to God, every believer will is also restored to God. Amen? Amen? That's right. That's one. The resurrection of Jesus matters because it gives us the assurance of our relationship with God in Christ. We are alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So this morning, as we wrap up things, as we think about the implications of the resurrection, Jesus' victory over sin, death, and hell, and the grave is every believer's victory over sin, death, and hell. All that is true of Jesus is true of us who have repented of our sins and believed in Jesus. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have the assurance of our resurrection from the dead. Jesus' resurrection to life guarantees our resurrection to life. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have the assurance of our release from the bondage of sin. Jesus' death for our sins was our death to sin. 
Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have the assurance of our residency with Christ. That Jesus abides with us now, we will, we will abide with Him for all of eternity. And lastly, because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have the assurance of our, our relationship with God in Christ. Jesus was restored to a right relationship with God, the Father, and so have we. That's why the resurrection matters so much to God's people. That's why the resurrection matters so much to God's people. And so I would just ask you this morning, does the resurrection of Jesus matter to you like it should? Right? As we think about these truths, these, these reasons we were reminded of this morning, does the resurrection of Jesus matter to you like it should? Are you experiencing the blessings and the benefits of the resurrection of Jesus? That they've afforded these things to you. Everyone that has believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior. See, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's Resurrection Day. That's right. It's Resurrection Day. Let us rejoice about our resurrection from the dead. Let us rejoice about our release from the bondage of sin. Let us rejoice about our residency with Christ. Let us rejoice about our relationship with God in Christ. Amen. We have something to be excited about, church. That's right. Happy Resurrection Day. Now I realize there may be some here this morning, maybe gathered with us, maybe some that are watching online this morning that, that don't have this, this same thing that we have. They're not rejoicing. They might be curious, but they're not, they can't rejoice as we do because they don't have the, the same presence of God living with them. They don't have the, the, the same re assurance of resurrection or release or residency or relationship that we have, but they can, That's right. right? God wants all people to be saved. He doesn't want any to perish in their sins. And so this morning, if that's, if that's you, if that's you, if this is just another holiday, if this is just another Easter where we just gather with friends and family and we eat a lot and we dye eggs and hunt eggs and all the little fun things that everybody else does, then, then you're missing out. You're missing the point. That's right. You're missing the point of Easter. But that can all change today. If you feel like the Lord is leading you to, to, to place your faith in Him, do it today. Mm -hmm. Do it today. There's no better time than today to do that. Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. And I would just add, add to you as we pray, uh, if you have believed in Jesus, we're going to have the Lord's Supper here in a moment. Uh, just use some time to, to do some business with God. Repent of any sin in your heart. Uh, the Bible warns us not to partake of it in an unworthy manner. And so I would just encourage you to do that, to spend a little time with God this morning uh, as we close. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you for this, is, this day. It's not just a holiday, holiday, it's a holy day. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for what happened on Good Friday. It wasn't, it wasn't good for Jesus, but it was good for the rest of the, the world. We thank you for Resurrection Day. We, we thank you for this day and what it represents. God, we're so thankful that your, your word tells us that the ladies and the disciples, when they went to the tomb, the tomb was empty. so thankful that Jesus is risen indeed. We're thankful, Father. We're thankful for the resurrection because of the resurrection of Jesus. We who have believed in your Son, Jesus, we have the promise of resurrection ourselves. We have been released from the bondage of sin. We have the residency with Christ and we have a relationship with you. It's been restored because of the cross. Because of the death of Jesus. Because of the resurrection. We thank you so much for that. But God, this morning we also ask that you would just do a work in the hearts of those who were gathered here with us. Those who are watching on the live stream and maybe even someone that will watch this or hear this in the future. That you would use the truth of the resurrection to bring resurrection power to their life, that they would turn from their sins, that they would believe in your son Jesus, that they would be saved, that they would also experience the resurrection to life. 
So Father, again, thank you for all that you have done for us, all that you are doing for us, and all that your word promises that you will yet do for us in the future. Help us to respond to the, the truth that we heard today in a way that's uh, honoring to you and beneficial to us. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.